Good morning, everyone. We want to welcome you this morning to St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Adam. I'm one of the pastors on staff. Whether you're worshiping with us here in person or watching with us online, we're so glad to have you with us today. If you are a guest with us, special word of welcome to you. There in front of you in your pew, you can find a Connect card that you can fill out and drop in the offering plate as it goes around. Or at the very end of our service, we want to invite all of our guests to go out the back sanctuary doors and to the left. There's a welcome table there. We would love to greet you and thank you for being with us. As you came in today, you should have received a worship guide. There are a lot of announcements in there. We want to briefly uh, hit the high points of some of those. Uh, the biggest one right now is that Vacation Bible School is starting this week. So Monday we start VBS. The information there is about how to register, especially if you have students that have not registered yet. There is still time to do that. And then remember, we wrap up VBS week on the 19th, Friday night, at our River City campus with a food truck Friday. So we have VBS here, Monday through Thursday, then food truck at River City on Friday night, and the food truck is Ramiro's Cantina. Everybody is welcome to come out and participate in that. One of the things we will pass around this morning is a basket that has the names of all of our Vacation Bible School volunteers. Uh, we want to invite you, if you're willing, to take one and commit to pray for that person throughout the week. So we have everybody here, whether it's staff or adult volunteers or our youth group volunteers. So please take a name and pray for them this week. The second one there that you see is our church-wide potluck. This is right around the corner, so next Sunday, July 21st, um, in Gordon Hall, we will have our potluck, and remember that that's preceded by combined service at 11. There are two ways that you can sign up. The first one is the Sign Up Genius link there in the announcement, but then we will pass the clipboard uh, one more time again this morning. You guys are doing great. It's almost filled uh, with all the things we need. Uh, things like Carrie Jarbo is bringing fried chicken, doesn't that sound delicious? Or uh, Brenda and Max are bringing macaroni and cheese. That sounds really good. Or, or one of my favorites for dessert, Ashley and John are bringing banana pudding, which I requested and I see somebody signed up. So we'll pass this around one more time uh, and uh, hopefully we fill all those slots and have a great time of food and fellowship on the 21st. Next, there is a uh, fundraiser opportunity for our River City campus and some different missions and ministries that they're participating in. So that trivia night uh, is July 20th in the evening, 6 p.m., and you can see their information about registration, and uh, Pastor Renee is the point of contact for that. Last but not least, there in your worship guide, uh, we are in need of additional office volunteers. This is a critical part of the hospitality ministry of our church throughout the week. And so you can see their information about the different tasks that those volunteers are involved in. And if you would like to sign up or have questions, our church administrator, Sandy Hoddle, is the point of contact for that. And you can just get in touch with her. One that is not in your worship guide is we wanted to announce through our staff parish relations committee that we are going to be having a reception for our music ministry staff, uh, Noel, Mark, and Aaron. Uh, are sadly all leaving us at the end of this month, and so we want to honor them and show our gratitude for just years of wonderful and faithful ministry. And so we will have a reception for them on Sunday, August 4th at 5 p.m. in the evening. So we want to invite you back that Sunday night, uh, help us celebrate these three guys and the wonderful work they've done here in our music ministries at St. Matthew's. Uh, last but not least, you notice there at the top of your worship guide, uh, the beautiful flowers on our altar today are in honor of Miss Charlotte Mosley, uh, celebrating her 90th birthday uh, this Tuesday. And so uh, we are so excited to celebrate with her and just want to hold Charlotte and her family in our prayers this week. Those are all the announcements we have this morning. Again, thank you for worshiping with us. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with our opening prelude.
Good morning. Will you please stand for our call to worship? In the beginning, God created all things. At our beginning, God created us, unique, Lord God, King of creation, open our eyes to see your presence, our souls to sense your presence, and our hearts to love your presence, ever here in our creation and ever beyond it in eternity. Amen. As you are able, please remain standing and join me in our affirmation of faith from the Book of Romans, which is printed in your bulletin. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. We are going to focus on two different things in our prayer time. Uh, the first one we had planned on uh, focusing on our Vacation Bible School uh, teachers and volunteers and students. And so we'll begin our prayer time with a special prayer focus on them. Uh, then in light of the events of last night and the attempted assassination of former President Trump, we do want to have a time of focus as well in prayer for our country and its leaders. And so for the second part of that prayer time on page 429 in your hymnal, 429 contains a prayer for our country. And so we will have that as the second focus of our prayer time and then close with the Lord's Prayer together. But if you could go ahead and have that ready, page 429. We want to begin, though, by asking if you are at all in, are involved in our Vacation Bible School this week, uh, whether you are a teacher or a craft leader or helping in the kitchen or one of our roaming kind of safe sanctuaries volunteers, we want to invite you to just stand right where you are or if you're one of our students planning to participate this week, we want to invite you to stand as well. Um, don't make me name names. I know more, and we want you to remain standing. Stand and remain standing, yes. And we want to pray for you and bless you as you begin this Vacation Bible School Week with us. So let's pray. God, we thank you so much uh, for the celebration of Vacation Bible School and this important mission that is an annual part of the ministries of our church. Uh, when we focus very intensely and daily on ministering to the children of our church, but also to the children of our community. And God, we pray that over all these students and teachers and volunteers and staff people, that you will just surround them with your presence and your love. Lord, help them to experience uh, the good news of the gospel and join with us uh, in celebrating this week. God, we just pray a hedge of protection over them for this week, that you will watch over them and keep them safe, help everything to run smoothly. And Lord, we pray that it would all be for your honor and your glory. We pray all this in your name. And we ask you to be seated. Lord, our hearts also break by the things we see happening in our country. When we turn on the news and see news of an assassination attempt, news of lives lost, news of chaos and disruption, Lord, our hearts just drop. And it's one of those moments, uh, like so many others in history, when we think to ourselves, we will remember where we were uh, when this awful tragedy happened. And God, so much of the sentiment that we hear around us is that prayers are going up for our country, for its leaders, for the families of those whose lives were lost, for those victims who were injured. And Lord, we join our voices and our prayers with prayers from around the world today as we pray together. Oh God, Keep our whole country under your protection. Wipe out sin from this land. Lift it up from the depth of sorrow, O Lord, our shining light. Save us from deep grief and misfortune, Lord of all nations. Bless us with your wisdom, so that the poor may not be oppressed and the rich may not be oppressors. Make this a nation having no ruler except God, a nation having no authority but that of love. Amen. And now we join our hearts together to pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue to worship today, we want to give of our tithes and offerings. And so we'll invite our ushers to come forward to receive our offering here in person. 
We also want to call your attention to the screen, especially if you're worshiping with us online today, to remind you that you can mail in your offering, you can text to give, or you can also give directly on our website, stmatthewsmethodist.com. Uh, there in your worship guide, there is a QR code uh, that you can scan that will take you to all of that information and other ways that you can give as well. So let's honor God with our gifts this morning.
Lord, we pause to thank you today for all the blessings you've poured out upon us. Your word tells us that every good and perfect gift has come from you. Lord, we pray that our response would be to, pe to be a people of generosity. Lord, bless our tithes and our offerings that they would be used for your kingdom and your glory. And bless us as we go out into the world that we will each be instruments of your peace and your love. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. As you are able, please remain standing for this reading from the book of Genesis. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The man became a living being. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This morning we are continuing our sermon series that we started last week, uh, Kids Say the Darndest Things. 
where we are focusing on real life questions from this year's confirmation students. Uh, we warned you last week, especially as we were answering a question like, is our church a cult, uh, that these questions are not easy, uh, they're not comfortable questions, they don't always have clear answers. And so you'll remember last week we invited you to be brave together with us as we wade into the messiness and complexity of these questions together. Uh, I just want to say again that we are so incredibly blessed by the curiosity, the engagement, the joy of our students, and we are so excited for you to be blessed by them as we dive into these conversations. Today's question, as you see there in your worship guide and on your GPS, is do we have an eternal soul? Do we have an eternal soul? To set the stage for this question, we want to begin by acknowledging, right, that this is a question not just asked by our students, but by theologians, by philosophers, by researchers, neuroscientists for generations. Uh, for example, there was a famous experiment by a scientist named Duncan McDougall all the way back in 1907. You maybe read about this somewhere along the way in your education, that he believed if there was a soul, then it would have to weigh something. It would actually have to have mass. And so he wanted to weigh the human body immediately before death, and then he weighed the human body immediately after death, and then he subtracted the two and tried to figure out, was there a noticeable weight difference there that would represent the human soul? Or there have also been thousands of recorded near-death experiences. This is the one, one of the things we research. There's actually a whole group called the Near-Death Experience Research Foundation. It's devoted to trying to answer this question of whether or not there's a part of us that continues to exist and be conscious after death. Finally, and most recently, uh, neuroscientists have been very fascinated with the phenomenon that certain atomic particles, things way smaller than you and I can see with the naked eye, they actually behave differently in tests when they are being observed by human beings. In other words, those particles do one thing when nobody is there watching, but then the very same particles do something different if you and I were sitting there actually observing the experiment. And the researchers are curious uh, if this is proof that there's something going on in our world, some interaction between the human soul and those particles that goes beyond just chemistry and physics and biology. Now, I'm of course not saying anything definitive about these studies. You can read for yourself this week that they have been proven and disproven and debated for decades. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is something we are really, really curious about as human beings. And it's not just theologians or researchers or scientists, it's me and you who have asked the question, do we actually have an eternal soul? And today our goal is we want to turn to scripture and see what the Bible tells us about this question. There inside your worship guide, you'll find a GPS, a grow, pray, and study guide where you can follow along with the main points of this morning's message and fill in the blanks there. As we have every week, there are also daily scripture readings there that all connect back to this morning's message and this question about the eternal soul. Number one there in your GPS, the first thing the Bible teaches is that there is a part of us beyond the physical that distinguishes us from the rest of creation. There's a part of us beyond just what's physical. In our scripture reading this morning, we have the story of the creation of human beings. Verse 7, there at the beginning of Genesis, says, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Uh, that word that is translated living being in the NIV is the Hebrew word nefesh, which actually is the Hebrew word for soul. Nefesh literally means that which is alive. And I want you to notice the connection here for the writer of Genesis, the connection between God's act of creation and human beings becoming a living soul. God breathes into us the breath of life, ruach, and then we become a living soul, nefesh. The thing the writer of Genesis wants us to see is that this part of us, the part of us that goes beyond just the physical, the living soul that God breathes into us, 
is the part that distinguishes us from the rest of creation. And Genesis 1 goes to pretty far lengths to make this very explicit. Uh, For example, Genesis 1, this is 26 through 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It's important for us to realize, though, at this point, that the Hebrew understanding of the soul is not that it's just the spiritual part of us, but it actually encompasses our whole being. And the best way for us to capture this is that no one in this time would have ever said, I have a nefesh, or I have a soul. They would have said, I am a nefesh, I am a living soul. And I've always loved Thomas Oden's definition of this. He says the soul is not a separate part of the person alongside the body, but it is the very aliveness of the person that is in dialogue with God, oneself, and other selves. Simply put, you are a living, breathing being of sacred worth because you've been created in the image of God. Number one there in your GPS, there is a part of us beyond the physical that distinguishes us from the rest of creation. And that leads us to number two, though, and and a conversation that I think is really important for us to have is that the Bible teaches that this part of us, our soul, is connected to so many different parts of the human experience. It's connected to so many different parts of the human experience. You know, usually this question comes up as an end-of-life question, right? When someone asks, do I have an eternal soul, they are asking that because they want to know, is there a part of me that's going to continue to exist after my physical body here on earth has breathed its last breath? And, And that's probably why most of us would ask that question. But the Bible has a very different view of the soul. Uh, The word nefesh comes up over 700 times just in the Old Testament, and it's connected to so many different things that maybe normally you wouldn't think about. I want to give you just a sampling and lift up some scriptures here. Uh, For example, the Shema commands us to love God with all of our soul. That's maybe one we're very familiar with. Deuteronomy 6.5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. The Bible talks about the soul as something that longs for God or thirsts for God. For example, Psalm 42, 2 asks, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with him? Our soul is what we're called to praise God with. Psalm 103, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Our souls can be poured out to God in prayer. Hannah said in 1 Samuel 1, I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord in prayer. You fast forward to the New Testament, the soul is linked with something that can be burdened or that your soul can find rest. You remember Jesus' famous invitation in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. As Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he was arrested, Jesus experienced suffering in his soul. Matthew 26, 38, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Finally, our soul is something that can be lost or forfeited, or it's something that can be redeemed and made holy. Mark 8, 37, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
I think it's interesting that even if you get outside of the scope of Scripture, many of us use soul kind of language even in our everyday lives, right? That we talk about our soul being burdened. We talk about our spirits being lifted, maybe refreshed and energized. We say something is good for our souls. You know, we take a vacation or we take a rest and we're like, oh my goodness, I just feel so much better in my soul or in my spirit. Uh, we read all those chicken soup for the soul books. Do you remember that? Right? <laughs> Nationwide bestseller book after book that evidently there was something going on there that we were seeking something to nourish our souls. People even talk about listening to soul music or eating soul food. And what we're saying when we use that word so many times is that something is affecting us at the very core of who we are. It's going deeper than just the physical. And so we want to remember today, number two there in your GPS, that the soul is connected to so many different parts of the human experience. And that brings us to number three, and the final point in our GPS today, is that the soul is the part of us that by God's power and grace continues for all eternity. Continues for all eternity. As we come to this last point, I think this is probably the reason our confirmation students ask this question. It's probably the reason human beings have pursued it for generations. Like we said, we want to know what happens when we take our last breath on this earth. Does that part of us that makes us who we are continue after death or not? And there are a few clarifications that we want to make here. Uh, the first one you don't think about very often, we do not believe the human soul is eternal on its own that our human souls just have this inheritant, inherent immortality. And that's based on our belief that God alone is eternal, that God alone has absolute immortality, and that all other eternal life that is possible or that exists is given as a gift by God, that it's only made possible by God's power and grace. And, and you hear that belief in a verse as simple as something like John 3.16, Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. It is something that is given. Our soul is not eternal on its own, but in connection, in relationship with God. Secondly, the thing we want to point out is that we believe that when our body dies, our soul is immediately in the presence of God. And we'll look at a couple scriptures in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore we are always confident, and we know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Or another place Paul writes about this is Philippians 1, 21 through 23. He says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. But then he says, I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. Finally, the last clarification we want to make with this question is that we believe that death does not have the final word for those who trust in Jesus Christ. And we proclaimed this in our affirmation of faith from Romans chapter 8 this morning, that we said we are sure that neither death nor life, angels or principalities, things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, if you have been to a funeral, a celebration of life, as a part of the ministries of our church, uh, you know that my favorite part of any of those services is to remind us that because of God's love, we do not look at the end of life like those who have no hope. That we believe with all of our hearts that the moment we breathe our last breath on this earth, we enter immediately into the presence of God. The God who created us, the God who has walked with us through all of our different seasons of life, the God who loves us, 
more than anyone else in the universe. And we can't even begin to imagine the joy and the peace that we will experience together in God's presence. And we believe and reaffirm today that all of those saints who have gone before us are now in a place where there is no more sickness, no more suffering or pain or tears. It's a place where all things are made new. Um, I share in almost every celebration of life that I do, uh, it's a very selfish moment in a way, but my favorite passage of scripture in the whole Bible uh, is from Revelation chapter 21. Uh, I was one of those kids growing up that I remember when I immediately became a Christian uh, that I wanted to read the end of the book first and I wanted to learn what happened, right? So I skipped all that other stuff and I think I read Revelation three or four times at the very beginning. I would not suggest that, uh, but because of that, uh, Revelation 21 is one of my favorites. And it's a verse where John gives us just a glimpse, just a foretaste of God's new creation. It says, I heard a loud voice from the throne of God saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And then the one who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Now as we talk about that hope, uh, that's not something you can really weigh on a scale, right? Like that famous experiment. It's not really something that you can get enough near-death experiences recorded and publish that in a journal and say we have just indisputably proven that there is a human soul and that there is eternal life. It's not even something that with all of our modern technology we can capture on microscopes or with high resolution imaging or with the greatest supercomputers our world has. So much of what we believe as Christians we will not know for certain this side of eternity because as scripture says we see as in a mirror dimly but we trust in these things by faith until one day we meet jesus face to face so as we think about our own soul i want to leave us with three quick questions today that maybe you would just ask yourself in prayer as we close our service the first one is a very traditionally Methodist question. How is it with your soul today? Maybe your soul feels lifted and refreshed and you're on cloud nine. Maybe your soul feels very burdened and heavy or chaotic or troubled. What is a word you would use to describe your soul today? Second question is how are you bringing your soul into relationship with God? Or maybe a better way of asking it is, how are you bringing your whole self into your relationship with God? How are you bringing your whole self into the dialogue of prayer that you're actually communicating with God about how your soul really is today? And then finally, how are you holding on to God's promise that our souls will find rest and peace in Him forever? I want to invite you to stand together with me and I'll pray for us as we move into our last hymn today. And let's surrender ourselves in prayer as we consider these questions together this morning. Jesus, before we ever say a word to you in prayer today about how our soul is, you already know the true state of each of our souls. You know souls that are joyful and light and full of excitement this morning. You know souls that are heavy and troubled and worried. You know souls that are chaotic and, and confused and really struggling with which direction to go in life and Lord, so many feelings and so many struggles in between. Lord, you search us and you know us better than we know ourselves. But Lord, we seek today to bring our whole selves to you, to love you with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. 
Lord, help us to hold nothing back in pursuing our relationship with you. Help us to hold nothing back in how we're reaching out in love to others. And Lord, we do hold on to this hope, this promise you make to us, this gift of eternal life. And Lord, we hold on to it not just for ourselves, but we hold on to that promise for so many saints who have gone before us. And we ask that we would comfort one another with these words today, to trust that they are at home in your presence. So Lord, we surrender this time of invitation to you. Draw us nearer to you, God, and draw us nearer to one another. We pray all these things in Christ's name and all God's people said. Amen. Let's worship together as we sing our final hymn today. We want to thank you again for worshiping with us today. Just a couple quick reminders. Uh, did the clipboard and the basket of prayer requests make its way all the way around? Wonderful. If for some reason you did miss that, it's here in the front of the sanctuary. Like I saw Harrison hadn't signed up for the potluck yet. So if, if you need to go sign up, uh, feel free to do that. Um, also, remember, if you are a guest with us this morning, if you go out the back sanctuary doors and to the left, Miss Brenda will be there to greet you at our welcome table. And thank you for being with us. As you go today, would you receive this benediction? May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ his Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Have a great Sunday.